Okay, welcome to um, a Five Years Out panel. These are panels that NCA asked various divisions to participate in in anticipation of NCA's 100th anniversary in five years' time, hence Five Years Out. I don't know if there's going to be four-year-out panels or three-year-out panels, but, but there is a five-year-out panel in Chicago because I guess the 100th anniversary will be in Chicago. So this is the Critical and Cultural Studies Division five-year-out panel, which... When I, and I'm here, sorry, my name is Craig Robertson. This year I was the program coordinator for the Critical and Cultural Studies Division, hence I'm standing up here now. Um, in talking with other program planners and other divisions, these, these panels sort of had a different dynamic for divisions who were much older than us, and there was a lot of nostalgia and revisiting and pulling people out from retirement and so forth. Whereas Critical Cultural Studies had to struggle to figure out how old we even were um, <laughs> as we assembled this panel, and the general assumption is it's about 15 years old. So um, what we have today on the panel is an esteemed group of scholars who will not be talking about their research um, today, <laughs> um, but rather will be talking about the fascinating history of the Critical and Cultural Studies Division. Um, what I'm going to do before we kick it off is just have everyone very quickly go through and um, introduce themselves and very briefly explain why they're here, that is, what position they held or when they were involved in the division, and then we, we do have a sort of structure that we will follow um, in the not-quite-structured way that the Critical and Cultural Studies Division works. So, Melissa, do you want to just say hi to everyone? Hi, um, Melissa Deem, and um, I'm here because I was involved in kind of informal talks with people when they were agitating. Um, that was when I was... Uh, a grad student coming out on the job market, so I was talking to Barbara about feeling like it was a, a very vulnerable time, and I could talk later about the dynamics within the field of how feminism and cultural study got coded in ways that were very exclusionary and, and erased particular kinds of scholarship, and I was the chair of the 2001 program. I'm Barbie Secker. Um, I'm here because I was there at the start, although I barely remember it, um, and I was there because of, to use a, a turn of phrase that we don't know whether it belongs to Rosier or Badu, I wasn't part of the count, and um, I wanted a place to put my work and a place to speak, and so some folks had some uh, ideas about cutting a new space, and so... At one point, Ramey McCarroll pulled me into a room, and actually I realized we were an institution at that moment in the way that I hadn't understood the institutionality of, of what we do. Um, and it went from there. I was the first program planner, um, and I had to uh, hustle <coughs> to get <coughs> submissions, um, and it went from there. Um, I, uh, I started having conversations with Kent and, other, and Carol and others around 1995. I just started my first job as assistant professor at the University of Texas. Um, we'll share some memories about these questions of, ex of space and dynamics of trying to get certain things in. I mean, the, 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 one of my precipitating events is a, is a recall of a double panel on post-structuralism that didn't get accepted and then kind of found ourselves having a conversation, what just happened? Why, why can't all of these people talk about this, right, at NCA? And so that's my recall of when I started the conversation and it, it entered into the conversation about this, but it was right around 1995. Uh, helped to organize the Critical Cultural Studies Summer uh, thing. We had a big summer uh, thing at Iowa, uh, and I helped to organize that, was a, was a program planner for that and seminar uh, leader for that. Um, through my involvement with this division, I helped by, I think it was 2000, maybe 2002, actually the Alta Argumentation Conference for a while was having a critical and cultural studies divi uh, division, and I was, I, was a, I was a program planner for that, right? Um, and then I became, and we have a, we, we had a system in critical cultural studies that um, you, you, you started your leadership, like, it, it lasted for five years. I mean, it, it's incredibly long, but we had third vice president. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I think so right around 99, 2000, I start, I program right after uh, Melissa. So I program in 2002, 
And just to compare or contrast with Barb, uh, I had over 100 papers and nearly 80 panels submitted uh, that year. Right? So it, in a very quick time, this thing exploded. Yeah. Thing exploded. Okay. Uh, yeah, my, my name is Ken Ono. I'm at the University of Illinois, and I'm not sure how much you, you want me to say at this point, Craig. But, um, yeah, I was an assistant professor at the University of California, Davis, in 1994. Um, Carol Blair was my esteemed um, senior colleague there, thankfully. And um, uh, uh, Ann Chisholm and, and Doug Thomas and I and Carol uh, started having a series of conversations about what was happening with post-structural scholarship in particular, but also uh, kind of cultural studies scholarship. And uh, we were trying to figure out what to do, and we started by talking about um, having an edited collection, um, and that changed form and focus, and we started talking about maybe a journal. And um, Ann Chisholm, in fact, um, started the kind of uh, uh, institutional part by uh, approaching Jim Gaudino about the who was at the time the um, executive director executive director of NCA and um, uh, it was because of this panel that I had helped to put together with a, a group of um, many of the people on, uh, in front of this room uh, that we submitted to the rhetoric um, uh, and communication theory division uh, focusing on rhetoric and post-structuralism it got rejected, and in the summer of 1995, I, I would say that was kind of the beginning of where we really started thinking uh, institutional change and structure, beginning to have a lot of uh, conversations not only with um, NCA administration, but amongst ourselves about what to do. And um, while we were talking about a journal and a book initially, it eventually um, turned to uh, creating a division and so for the next year and a half or more, we were um, engaged in, in trying to develop a proposal and get people involved in thinking about that. Um, it, uh, 1996 was, the, the, sadly, the year that, I, that the boycott of um, California was happening because of Proposition 187 in California. I wasn't there. And Barb and um, Ramey and Doug and Carol um, took the ball and ran it through the process that, at that conference and surprisingly at the end of it we had, we had a division and it was kind of shocking. <laughs> it was very shocking. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carol Blair. I'm currently at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and was Kent's colleague at UC Davis at the time that this was, was getting started. Pretty brand new associate professor but at least had a little bit of protection. Um, and I was, along with, with Doug and Anne and Kent, were, I was one of the early agitators, as Melissa, I think, put it. Um, and um, I have not held a, a divisional post um, because I kept crawling into other divisions and offering to do work so that they might actually accept my work. But one of the, the, the ways in which this basically started, as you will hear, um, came out of a set of frustrations um, of, of simply trying to force fit our work into divisions of the field that couldn't really accommodate it and in many cases certainly didn't want to. And so I think that, and, and you'll hear more detail about that, but it was um, our, and I, I don't want to romanticize this because um, I think that, that the institution of NCA finally did accommodate us and accommodate us very well. And so, um, but there, there were some frustrations in the early 90s and into the mid-90s about how it was that great, great, great PhD programs were producing wonderful scholars and their work was being going unrecognized by NCA. I'm Ray McCaro, and uh, when this was initiated, I was at the University of Maine and then transitioning to Ohio University, where I currently am. I'll describe my role in more detail a little bit later, but I guess I could call it the institutional role, where one of the things you will hear here and you will hear in other divisions in this association is the denial of a particular program prompts the group that organized that program and those with like-minded interests to come together and say, so what do we do about it? And that's not an unusual occurrence within the culture of NCA. 
fortunately or unfortunately. We have had other divisions that have been created in exactly the same way with respect to a frustration that certain work was, no, was not being recognized or we could not find the right home for that work. And so the kind of story that we're talking about is not unique in terms of how other areas of research have also been frustrated and created new homes within the association. So we'll talk more about that as we move forward. I'm John Slip uh, at Vanderbilt University. I guess if the history is right, I was, at, I was at Drake University when all this started. Uh, I was the second editor of the Journal of Communication and Critical Cultural Studies after Bob Ivey uh, did it first. And Greg Wise is now editing it, and I don't know if he's here today. Um, I am here today because I edited the journal. Uh, but one of the things I want to talk about later is, in, in fact, in the founding of this division, I was really quite, and these, these were all my friends, these were people I knew and, and struggled with in other ways, but I was really quite ambivalent about the founding of this division in the journal, and I had concerns about it, uh, which, which I was wrong and they were all right, uh, but I think the, the, the concerns that I had are ones that I still think are concerns we should think about, and I'll talk about those a little bit later. Uh, I guess what I want to say is I, I, I was so ambivalent about this that I don't think I attended a business meeting until I was editing the journal. That's probably right. So never in the five-year leadership route or any of that. So we'll talk about that a little bit, too. Hello. I'm Chris Camrath, and uh, I was a grad student, second-year grad student uh, on the panel that Kanta organized that didn't happen and at a lot of these early meetings. But I'm one of the few people up here who can claim absolutely no founding role in the division. <laughs> I was a participant observer for much of this, involved in the email debates and whatnot. And uh, the second year of the division, third year of the division, I became the archivist as the elected archivist of the division. And unfortunately, they never elected another archivist. <laughs> so um, that's me. As I'll explain later, it hasn't been a demanding job. And I think that means something. Uh, yeah, I'm Ben Atias, um, And... Uh, I don't know if, if, if Ramey is the, uh, the institutional, plays the institutional role, I guess I play the anti-institutional role, perhaps. Um, I, I, I kind of found my way to cultural studies by way of rhetoric, you know, and um, was sort of surprised and, and, and frustrated like everybody else, you know, seeing that, there, that, that the space that I thought, you know, it seemed very natural that there should be this space here and, and, and that it simply wasn't. Um, and uh, I don't know, I mean, my... First institutional role, I guess, was as the webmaster, if my memory is correct, um, um, for the division, which I guess I did that for a couple of years. And uh, uh, I tried actually going through to find the old, very old web pages from the from the mid '90s, you know, to, uh, to to but didn't find any of that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I guess I've been kind of uh, 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 touched by the um, the uh, play of anti-institutionalization and institutionalization, if I can say that, you know, the kind of resist, the dynamic of resistance and institutionalizing a forum for, for resistance scholarship. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think that's, that's the tension that we are, I mean, you know, at the time this was happening, a lot of us were, were not, you know, tenured, we're not, we're, we're grad students, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, here we are a dozen or so years later, um, you know, an institution, so... Thanks. So um, what we're going to do now for the rest of our session, um, each of the panellists up here is going to say some brief words, I think a bit more generally, the, speaking a bit more generally, perhaps occasionally a bit more specifically than they have um, now. But I should actually say, I should have said this um, at the beginning, in case you're not aware, the Critical and Cultural Studies Division is one of the three largest divisions in NCA. We have 1,400 plus members. Um, we consistently are given the largest number of panel slots 46, though from emails I got after programming, I guess 46 wasn't enough. Um, um, so we have um, a large number of slots. I should add this was not one of the slots. This is not instead of your scholarship. This is a vice presidential session. Um, so um, we are, just to be clear, we are one of the largest divisions, and the growth has happened incredibly fast. And I think one of the things that NCA wanted to us to address, which I think will come through implicitly and perhaps explicitly in our discussion, is, well, where is this division what the people who started it out thought it might be? If not, is that a good or a bad thing? If it is, is that a good or a bad thing? Um, as we sort of reflect upon the beginnings and early years and development of the division. So the way we're going to do that in a sort of somewhat informal way, I think, as I understand it, Carol and Kent are going to begin um, 
and sort of establish it in, in slightly clearer terms the origins of the division. And Barb and Ray are going to talk. Ramy are going to talk a little bit more about the, the legislative council side of things. And then we're going to go through the um, other participants um, in chronological order of their involvement. Sloot, you are in there, you know. <laughs> um, and so, and, and, the, and these people will again speak to the issues that they, um, well, everyone is going to speak to the issues that they see as important and pertinent to understanding how critical cultural studies, the critical and cultural studies division got to where it is today. So um, I will um, hand the floor over, I guess, to Carol and Keith to begin. Yeah. And say, like, roughly, you know, 10 minutes maybe? Um, uh, I'm just going to add a few things to what I already said. Which I know I gave a general gloss of what was happening, so I'm just going to give a few more details, which was um, just, to, just before we proposed the, the, um, uh, the division, uh, Ramey actually crafted at, off of um, some of Carol's notes about what a division might be configured around, what kinds of topics, what kind of foci. And uh, Ramey culled together a proposal that then we could take to NCA and we had to get a petition going and we had to get uh, people signing on to it in order to get um, the division approved at, 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 the, um, at the convention. And we circulated that by email and it was kind of a funny process because um, Barb and I and um, Carol and Ray, I think, were all trying to get signatures uh, via email uh, using this petition, and we, we sent it uh, all over the place to get that done, but um, we all had individual people who were uh, who we ourselves had gotten to sign our, our petition, and some of them overlapped with others. So um, when Barb and, and Ray came together to kind of figure out, and, and Carol came together to figure out what, what names we had, they had to rush, you know, and so I went back through the emails to see, uh, to remember kind of what was happening, and it was really clear that at every stage of the kind of um, effort to institutionalize this division in the journal, um, we were we always felt under a timeline and had to work extremely quickly. And the quality of the work that I think emerged in those moments and the kind of work emerged in those moments is really telling of um, what what the division um, division became. Um, I, I I wanted to note that after that convention. Um, uh, uh, Ramey was the first uh, division chair, I believe. He had to be named at the convention that. Um, but then Barb was the first programmer, um, and then she was the next chair, as I recall. Um, and right after that first convention, uh, Barb went home and um, had to immediately start working on creating, crafting a, um, d a division call, like a call for papers and things, as well as um, uh, figure out who was going to be next in line and everything. So we, we didn't even, we hadn't even begun, and suddenly we had to elect people without a kind of division meeting to do so. So th at the beginning, it was just, it was kind of crazy that, that we were actually able to kind of uh, put that together, and I think uh, Barb's work at that point was really, really amazing. So... Yeah, I, I just want to speak just briefly about a, a time slightly before that, um, before the sort of institutional work that, that people did. Um, and they were very committed people who did that. Um, we had, uh, the, several people here have mentioned the, the double panel that was rejected from RCT, which was a catalyzing event, I think, for, for many of us. And, um, but it wasn't the first. Um, yeah. It was oh, the last <laughs> in a series of frustrations. Um, even when we did get things squeezed into a niche in, in RCT or public address or where, fem, uh, the, the feminist division or wherever we could find to sort of squish ourselves in, um, we usually ended up in a room behind a construction zone where most people were wearing hard hats, right? And nobody could find it. <laughs> and so so I, I think that there was, there was just such a general frustration. And, and one of the things that there was a, also a growing antagonism, especially in the rhetoric ranks, and it was it was really quite distasteful. But um, Anne Chisholm and Doug Thomas, who really were also very instrumental in the early part of this process, organized uh, a couple of what did they call them? Well, initially it was a seminar, and then they changed it 
as Anne says, unfortunately, to German art German. the second time. <laughs> Germinating something. Um, but but to, try, to try to bring together both, both traditional rhetorical scholars and not so rhetorical, or not so traditional rhetorical scholars to see if we could find some common ground. And some of you were at that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think many of us left that meeting believing that there was no common ground left. Um, and it, I think that that was wrong. <laughs> but I think, but, but it, was, it was not a particularly pleasant um, kind of experience for some of us. So I think um, that, that also was a catalyst, but a very early one um, in this. And, and as things kept getting rejected, and, and it wasn't just from NCA, the NCA convention, it was from journals, it was all over. Um, that and and the the California people Doug and Ann came up from Southern California to to have little meetings in Davos with us and and to try to figure out what kinds of things to do. Can't mention this before. Whether and we started backwards. We started thinking, let's do a journal, <laughs> as if right. Um, and I mean that would have been impossible, but but probably made possible in the end by um, the, the incredible success and growth of the division. So. Ramey so, um, and um, Bob are going to talk about what they're going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> for, like, uh, for like, you know, no more than 10 minutes in total. Do you want to start, Barb, or you want me to? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I had indicated earlier that I played more of an institutional role in terms of uh, with Anne and others working with Jim Godino and the NCA establishment to make sure that we had a petition with the right number of signatures and we got on the NCA agenda with respect to the Legislative Council and so on and so forth. And as Carol has said, there was a good bit of disgruntlement on the part of those in the tr more traditional rhetoric area. They were concerned with what would happen to RCT, Rhetoric Communication Theory Division, what might happen to public address division. But more generally within the association, also a concern that is unfortunately still here today with the fragmentation of the discipline, that we're going to grow more divisions than we can manage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think we've done rather well in that regard, by the way. Uh, but that's a constant kind of concern, and those kinds of issues were also raised at the Legislative Council. The one thing that I do distinctly recall in terms of uh, my age and memory is the name that we had given the division for operating purposes with regard to getting emails out. We had to call it something. And so we came up, I'm not sure if I invented it or others invented it. I'll take the blame if I did. Uh, something like critical and cult cultural discourse, theory, and practice. Practice, but quite practice. And practice. practice. But, yeah, quite, quite frankly, that captured exactly what we were trying to do, that it was both theoretical issues and practical or praxis issues that we were interested in capturing, as well as critical issues and cultural issues. And we were focused on discourse. So from one sense, at least, it was a meaningful concept phrase that people could say, I'll join that. I know what those words mean. I know that that fits the kind of work I do in some form or another. And at that particular legislative council meeting, somebody stood up and said, that's a really stupid name, in effect. <laughs> they were nicer about it. I believe it was David Our Zare argument was... David Zarefsky. Yes. And I wasn't going to name names. <laughs> he was probably right. Our argument then was, look, folks, if you approve this, we will change the name. <laughs> Trust us to come up with something that is far more workable as a title within the context of NCA naming, et cetera, et cetera. And by God, they bought it. And so that's basically, that was one of those issues where I'm not going to vote for this under this kind of title. And they trusted us as colleagues to come back to them at some point in terms of not for approval, but rather, here's the new name of the association, uh, the group, and we'll put it into the convention program, and away we go. So with that little bit of history, uh, we were off and running. That's my memory with Barb there as well. My recollection um, was I was hanging out in a hallway, and Ramey McCaro came and said, are you busy right now? And I said, no. <laughs> Everybody else was busy. Yeah. So, so I had to go. And um, 
we entered a ballroom, and I realized I had, we had spent a lot of time on the other side of those doors talking about language and power and those sorts of things. And when those doors opened, I thought, oh my god, I didn't know this other thing even existed. And there was this, the only thing that struck me at that time, you know, um, first year assistant professor maybe, was the only thing that was missing was the cigars. <laughs> um, there really was this entire apparatus. Um, I also recall very vividly not only the argument about fragmentation, but the um, rather robust resistance to the formation of a critical cultural studies division, primarily from rhetorical and communication theory. And I would say that I had no idea what this would become. I had no idea it would become this big. I think they did. I think they got it before. We, these kids that were running around looking, I think they knew something was coming. Um, and there was really no turning it back. One of the strengths, I think, of the critical cultural studies um, division, it wasn't even a division, aggregate, aggregation at that time, was its openness. We didn't know who we were, and I don't think we knew who we were going to become. And in that sense, I think critical cultural studies was a space of invention. Um, I think an interesting critical genealogy could be written of this division and its relationship to and its struggles with questions of institutionalization and professionalization. Cultural studies proper, which is interesting in and of itself, of course, has struggled with this question that's in the literature and so forth. Um, but is it still that kind of space? Is it still a space of invention? It was a time of exceedingly um, uh, lively theoretical conversation. Um, it's not an accident, this is, a, well, post-structuralism. Um, and then how, what's post-structuralism's relationship to cultural studies now? And then the one term that seems to sort of always drop out, which is communication. Um, and of course, cultural studies relationship has a long history relationship to communication because, of course, Stuart Hall was originally going to call, if I recall correctly, Stuart Hall was going to originally call his program communication. Communication was in it. So, um, so I don't think we knew what we were going to become. I think that may have been a virtue. Um, and I think we want to pay attention to our relationship to the institution, to questions of professionalization, and to issues of ossification. Um, and so I had the good fortune then of working under John Slew uh, on the um, forum. John asked me no, I guess I think I approached you, right? Yeah, you're right, yeah. <laughs> and let, <laughs> and um, we said, let's do something different, make it a space of some kind of invention, and have forum conversation and exchange. Um, I think that's one of the cultural studies virtue, is to remain open. Um, and I think it's not okay when we start to close down. So... <clears throat> All right, so following on, my, uh, this is the structure, by the way. It's like the same words. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go through um, the other people who haven't yet spoken again um, to give them time to sort of address things and issues of concern, either at the time in which they were, were involved in the division or, or subsequent. <coughs> and we're going to do this in a rough chronological order, as best remembered by the participants. Um, and each, if each person can speak for about five minutes, I'll wave at you as you get close. So, um, Melissa, you're going to kick us off. Okay, great. Um, you know, I came into the division before I actually understood the exclusions. Um, mm -hmm. I was on a panel at Alta, I think in 93, with John and Kent, and um, really hit it off with them, and, and it was through them that I met Anne and Doug, and so it was an odd relationship to not really understanding all of this yet, but being involved in all these debates, and it felt really risky and um, exciting. And then it really hit me because when I went out in the job market, all of a sudden, the fact that um, what had made me get 
all these friends and intellectual um, colleagues because I was trained in feminism in a very theoretical way in cultural studies and in, in rhetoric and rhetorical theory became a liability for me. Um, or at least that's how it felt. So I'm on the job market, and you would see these wonderful feminist rhetoric jobs, and you'd be like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And time after time, they were getting hired uh, women who didn't do rhetoric, or didn't do feminism. Um, and that seems like unbelievable, hopefully now, I'm not sure if it is. Um, and the other thing that was happening, and, and this is, is one of the reasons I want to talk about this, not to make it autobiographical, is then rhetoric jobs um, were seen, if you did feminist and feminist theory, um, as delegitimate you as understanding the realm of rhetorical theory. So rhetoric not only placed its boundaries around post-structuralism and, and, and cultural studies, which clearly was happening, there were some real issues around gender um, and other intersectional political um, and intellectual projects. So the dealing with race, with, gen with gender sexuality, uh, class, was really something I would argue was very problematic at that time. And there were all kinds of ways in which exclusions were happening by uh, fitting you know, identity categories rather than intellectual labor and, and projects. Um, so there was a problem, in, in my eyes, in both like modes of inquiry that were being allowed as well as object formations that were being allowed to be studied. And so, that was, so I, as I was already involved in the formation of the division, I also was getting a real education in what it meant to be a particular kind of scholar. Um, and, you know, and it was a little risky to be you know, on the job market and involved in this group of people because I think even, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Carol said she had, she had just barely gotten the safety of tenure when this happened. So it was, it was really a risky, it, it, it's hard to convey that now because it seems so institutional and legitimated. We're the biggest division. And even by 2001, when I planned the program, we already had more submissions than any other division. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that, but I also wanted to go back to something Barb said about the lack of closure. And I think 90s was, the 90s was this amazing time of animated debates, of post-structuralism, of theoretical feminism, of incredible intellectual vigor um, and animation. And, and one of the things I would like us to think through is, are we trying to keep up that tradition of that invigoration? Are we not closing down? Have we you know, solidified and calcified into particular kinds of categories and modes of thinking? And where are we going into the future? Because we certainly, for a particular generations, not just a generation, provided avenues to um, have places to speak and, and do scholarship. And it's been a very invigorating process. And are we continuing that into the future? Uh, my name is Ron Green. I'm currently at the University of Minnesota. So while my history began at Texas it, it, as my first job during this period, um, it is at another institution, and all exoduses are sometimes you're pushed out as much as you leave. Um, and to just speak, and, and I don't mean to be too, well, let me, let me, put, let me give you two anecdotes. Uh, last year, I was helping some friends with the boycott of the Manchester uh, um, Hotel. And um, I walked into a room to help do some organizing. And a very dear friend puts their arms around me, hugs me, and says, I'm so glad critical and cultural studies is here. That's one. Second anecdote is there's going, uh, um, NCA is organizing a, um, a a rhetorical criticism conference this summer, and um, and you should all come. It's going to I think it's going to be very good. So please come. Uh, and um, I was asked to pass out the flyers for that um, event uh, at the critical and cultural studies meeting. In both of these anecdotes, I am actually the programmer of rhetoric and communication theory right now. <laughs> right, right. And so, I mean, I am so marked by this history, right? Now, in one way, I have done the absolute greatest moment of intellectual branding, right? That I, I, I can walk into a room and someone says, critical and cultural studies is here. <laughs> <laughs> My God, right? That's, wow, right? But I'm also talking about a history that Melissa's gesturing to, that Carol's gesturing to as well, and it comes out of feminist scholarship and race scholarship, that you get marked, right, by your scholarship, right? And that, that and this division meant that, 
right? To be part of this. So it doesn't matter that just about every article I've ever written is about rhetorical theory. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> right? But I am critical in cultural studies, right? And, and that's part of that branding, right? And that's also part of the, the, both the excitement of the time, but the risks and the vulnerabilities in the sense that when my tenure case went up to Texas, you had to find outside reviewers to review me, right? Um, and um, to just to, to tell one story, I was like, he's doing fine work. I'm just not sure it's rhetoric. <laughs> Right? Right? Well, that's all you need. I mean, you don't need much more than that to be sad, right? To, to hurt a tenure case, right? Even those that like him say, right? <laughs> right? He's not really doing what we hired him to do, which was to be a rhetorical scholar. Right, right, right. So, I mean, I am part of that vulnerability, right? At the same time, I'm part of the I- I- I excitement and the, and the successes that, that, that we have been a part of, and I'm proud of that, right? Um, but, you know, this was a very fraught space for five or six years, right? And now it's like, oh, critical and cultural studies is here. Great. And I, and I love that. But that fraught space has to be fully recognized. Right. For what it was during those those five or six years. Um, you know, I think uh, speaking of fraught spaces, I think what's interesting is the time that this was going on in, in the beginning was also a time where uh, cultural studies and, and 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 risky scholarship more generally, not just cultural studies. Um, was coming under, uh, it, was, it was a really rough political time for people doing this kind of scholarship, not just in our field, not just in communication studies. I mean, uh, uh, Dinesh D'Souza was leading people around the country talking about tenured radicals. Uh, Alan Sokal had that, that crazy hoax in, um, what was it, social text? Uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and so the idea of doing cultural studies automatically, even apart from being part of NCA, the idea that you were doing something that, that, that involved cultural studies um, automatically marked you as somebody you know that was that was doing something that really didn 't belong in academia um, and so I think the politics of the time really uh, 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 kind of emphasized that frustration that we were feeling and and, and, and really um, um, exacerbated it uh, and so you know in some ways you know this this division kind of grows out of that frustration and it's it 's almost like you know we start with this giant chip on our shoulders um, because we 're having to you know sort of we, well, we belong here. You know, we, we, we belong. We have. We should have a space here. We should have a space for this kind of scholarship and these kinds of conversations. Um, the amazing thing was the, the just the incredible growth. I mean, the, the, in such a short period of time, how quickly. Um, and, and and what appeared to be happening was that this scholarship really was all there. There, there, there were plenty of people in the field interested in that and doing that. And I think what, what Barb said earlier about how you know, the people who were most resistant to it probably knew better than we did what was going to happen. And it may even be to our advantage that we had that crazy name to begin with, um, just because it's like, oh, okay, well, nobody's going to join a division that has you know, 30 words in the title, so we don't have to worry about them. Sure, go ahead, have your division. And then, <laughs> and then it's, okay, it's critical to cultural studies, and then bam. You know? so, so, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think really the, the, uh, the idea of, of taking risks in scholarship is, is, is kind of one of the, you know, if we have founding principles, um, um, it's certainly one of them. And, you know, to, to I mean, for... Of a, a, a division that is uh, uh, post enlightenment in many ways, you know what uh, what uh, Foucault described as the enlightenment attitude of perpetual critique of the self. I mean, I think that that really um, um, undergirds and should continue to undergird uh, uh, this this division. So. Okay, uh, <laughs> I've got the microphone. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the accidental archivist of the Division of Critical and Cultural Studies, and uh, I wanted to kind of talk about the success of the division from the perspective of the archive. I mean, one of the things that every panelist has mentioned is how big the division has become, which is shocking for many of us when we were in rooms early on for business meetings when there were 10 or 20 people there, and because people had to be at other meetings to do real work in part, but... Um, 
but it's huge, right? And I want to think about from the perspective of the archive of marking that as success and what, whether we want to monumentalize that or not. Um, the archive as it exists is really consists of a bunch of emails and a few proposals. The proposal for the division, the proposal for the journal, the email debates about those. I'm happy to get other things like minutes, more emails if you want to send them to me. But the kind of surprising thing about the archive that I have, and perhaps it's the result of my poor labor, but uh, is the sparseness of the archive. And one of the things I want to I want to point out here is that's not because people in this division aren't publishing in a massive amount of work and that um, presentations at the conference don't end up in journals, either critical and cultural studies journals in the field or outside. But it's because as a division, we produce very few texts, right? As a division, we really produce minutes from our annual meeting and periodically when we have things like this, a debate about when did that happen, right? And so... Clearly, this is a division that started as a project, a project to clear intellectual, scholarly, political space. And so as Barb and Melissa marked out, the question is, what kind of project is it going forward and what, what sort of purposes does it serve? I think one of the things we need to keep in mind is, if we want to think about that question, we need to produce more texts as a division, as a collective, rather than in our individual scholarly projects. Um, having a uh, annual conference and panels at the conference doesn't doesn't do much in terms of um, bringing forward those debates. And we need to think about different temporalities for um, theorizing in the division, thinking about the project that the division might serve going forward, not the temporality of Critnet or Cult Stud L necessarily, um, or the temporality of, of the annual, of the, of the journal itself, which John will talk about but something perhaps closer to the forum section that Barb's been editing recently or um, the flowtv.org site, right? Something like, really seriously, a website or newsletter where we actually have debates ongoing um, in between our conferences, coming out of the conferences about issues critical to critical and cultural studies, about thinking about the, the debates we actually have and keeping those going. And so really, I just want to bring up this fact that collectively we've produced not that many texts. And so it makes me wonder about monumentalizing and our success. And if there isn't other ways we can think about what critical and cultural studies can do and how it can provide a kind of scholarly home for people in NCA. Hi, I'm John Slip. I want to talk about two quick things. I'll, I want to say one or two things about the journal that I want to talk about. Uh, uh, my, and it's not a counter history, but my concerns at the beginning of uh, the critical cultural studies divisions, and and and, um, and and why I think why I think I was wrong, and that's a tribute to, to all of you in this room and then the people on this panel. Uh, the journal communication and critical cultural studies, I think, has been. Um, uh, just keeps getting better and better, and that really has to do with uh, with a couple of things. Uh, first, the, the fabulous the, the fabulous scholarship, the, the scholarship in this area, uh, just keeps getting better as more and more people are, are focusing on this. But it's also a matter of a couple of things. When when I first thought about editing the journal, I had conversations with Barb. Uh, when she was just telling the story of the, the the beginning of the forum section. One of the things we both of us talked about is. is doing outreach, both on ideas and the types of people who published, et cetera. And we tried to do that, and I think that's helped. I think the, the forum section was fabulous. Uh, I really, uh, a great tribute to, to Barb's hard work putting that together. And I think the essays were good. We did, we did a lot of outreach. But one of the things we said, and I want, I, I want to emphasize this because I want you to hold all of the editors, especially of this journal, to this. One of the things I thought when I started, when I was going to edit the journal is, I thought, I have not enjoyed publishing in a lot of journals for a couple of reasons. And if this division is not only a division that's concerned with all types of political issues, but with the daily life and experience of the work produced, right, the labor goes in the essays, there are a couple of things we should do. And one of them is the editor should guarantee that the essay gets in the hands of the right readers, the right readers, which meant over 50% of the time I went away from my already rather large editorial board to make sure I tried my best to get it in the hands of the right people. There's nothing more frustrating than to have that happen otherwise. And secondly, I thought a journal sponsored by this division should be polite and respectful and not allow reviews by assholes to go forward to the readers, to the, to the authors. So I tried to, I rejected a couple of reviews I received on the grounds that their tone was wrong. And I think that's something else we should be able to demand from our journals, right, and especially from a journal of this division. Now, 
Um, I'm sure almost all of you have read um, that article Michael Barube published in, I think it was in the Chronicle a couple of months ago, and ended up all over Facebook and everyone talking about it. It's about the history of culture studies and its success or lack of success. And while I think he misses the mark in the, the article, I don't want to get into an argument with that today. What I do want to point out is this. In that article, he, he, he looks for several markers of success or lack of success, and some of those really have to do with institutionalization. How many departments do we have? How many of this or how many of that? And what he sees as sort of a lack of success, I see as success. But here's the deal. His concerns now, his markers, were the concerns I had at the founding of the division. So while these were all friends of mine and people that I worked with and wrote with and was on panels with, I, I, uh, I'm somewhat a contrarian by nature, but it's not just that. I, I, had, I had a concern that a division, I didn't care if the, the, the I don't care about institutionalization. I, have, I think there are good reasons for that. I wasn't concerned about fragmentation of the discipline. I think fragmentation can be fine. What I was concerned about was specifically what is cultural studies as a project? And one of the strengths I saw of the work that was being produced was that we had, and, and I thought these people were an example. These, these, when I met each one of these people, we were coming from different traditions somewhat, right? The rhetoricians, people, people who were being trained by Larry Grossberg were different than the people who were being trained by uh, Michael McGee, say, at, at Iowa. And, and also the people I'd meet from sociology or anthropology. And I thought the project of cultural studies, every, every issue we face, as people, every issue that takes place in culture, every system of meanings needs a multitude of approaches to get anywhere close to understanding it, to get anywhere close to making change. I was concerned that a division led to institutionalization, which would lead to a project that was standalone, that trained its own scholars, that would not lead to the sort of interdisciplinary effect that I thought was so important to this. Now, here's why I'm wrong. Here's why I was wrong. Here's why I think this division's worked so well. Uh, Carol, uh, no, it was Barb. Barb earlier said, you know, we didn't know how successful we, we, we would be, but they did. Now, I know she was really referring to the people who were against it, but I think there can be too much of an attitude or, or too much of a way of talking about this division, which says there are communication and critical cultural studies people, the marking that Ron talks about, and then there are the RCT people or the public address division people. But here's the truth. These are the RCT people. These are the public address division people, in addition to what else they do. The people on this panel, the people in this room, the reason why this is successful, if you ask me, is we have continued to maintain some intellectual foundations, in particular, more traditional divisions. And we've done the labor and work there as well, as well as, as, well as the types of projects that are so important uh, to, I think, the growth of communication studies and to the project of cultural studies. Thank you. Uh, Hi, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, our panelists for keeping to the time. So we actually have a reasonable amount of time left for discussion. Um, I think the panelists themselves may have questions for each other and comments, but before that, I would like to um, open it up to the floor for people to ask questions or comment about, um, the, like I said, there may be specific questions about what's been said about the origins and development of the division or comments about the division now. Um, and the possible future of the division beyond even five years out. And if I could ask you to identify yourself by name when you speak. Yeah, My name is Brandy Flawless. I'm at the University of New Mexico. Um, for Ron, I think, uh, you were talking about the vulnerability of critical cultural studies and how even five or six years ago it existed. And I'm wondering what you think about that now and then five years from now. Does is there still a lot of vulnerability that you feel, and do you think that that's going away? Do you think that it will completely absolve? There are lots of people who could talk to that question. Um, I'm the Donald V. Hawkins Professor of Communication at the University of Minnesota. Um, uh, I, I'm tenured. I, uh, my vulnerabilities are nowhere near what they are for other people now, right? So, so I don't mean to, you know tell a trauma story and, right, and, then, and, and then not recognize my own um, privileges. Right? I, 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 I wonder, uh, I think everybody is taking risks with their scholarship and people who are socially marked are always going to be doing risky scholarship by the simple <laughs> fact that they're socially marked in particular ways. Um, th that said, I almost uh, sometimes I, I, I joke with my friends and I go, "We won, right? I mean, we won. 
the, the, it's like, you know, the division's huge. Everything's sort of critical and cultural in some ways, right? I mean, certain things had to balance themselves out, right? About, you know, a sort of agreement of how we're going to do certain critical projects that I still think are have some funky logics of what counts as, as criticism. But, you know, I, I, I sometimes, and maybe this is my own privilege from where I'm standing, right, because my vulnerability is a lot less now, is, you know, wow, it's, everyone does critical and cultural studies, right? It's, we won, and, right, you know, it's, it's you know, it's great to do it, right? But I'm, I'm probably completely wrong, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? So, I mean, other people are going to have to tell those stories about their struggles today and how that uh, uh, affects them. Right. Yeah. Um, Star Muir from George Mason University. Um, I have a phrase and a question. The phrase is bureaucratization of the imaginative. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the question is, um, do you see this division as a focal point for praxis? Um, NCA is now on, in the throes of professionalization um, and Freedom of Expression um, group just met to talk about um, are we in fact going to be a venue for action as a group or are we simply individuals who meet together and go back and undertake praxis in our own ambit of influence. So, so I guess my question is um, do you see that in the bureaucratization of the imaginative vision that you all had early on do you see the division as still being a site um, for collective voice on issues in society? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, you know, the... the uh, uh, there, there's something exciting about being on the outside or being, you know, pushed aside and, 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 you know, having to fight your way through. And we don't have to do that anymore. And so, so in that sense, I mean, that's where the no part comes from, you know, that, that the bureaucratization of, of the imagination, you know, there's, there's a lot of great things about it. But that's something that you lose. You know, you lose that, that drama and that, that, that sense of a, a, a struggle and that, that you know, Excitement, you know, in a way. Um, but, uh, but, but I mean, I think absolutely, you know, every, everybody who's in this division or who's writing in this division and, and who's right, I mean, you know, as, as pointed out, we're in a lot of other divisions, we're in a lot of other spaces intellectually, um, is, is, is motivated in some way, you know, by, by some of the themes that, that brought us together in the beginning. Um, does that mean that, that you know, uh, uh, CCS is going to be, you know, uh, uh, issuing manifestos? I mean, I don't, I don't know. You know, that's that, it, it, it sort of depends on what that kind of collective, uh, politically engaged voice looks like to you, which, you know, it may be different for, for, for different people, I think. Um, but, I mean, absolutely. You know, I mean, I think the, 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 the passions are still there, and that's what, you know, and, and, and you know, Every year, lots of new people are, are, are adding to this um, collective voice. But um, are we all going to speak with one collective voice? I mean, gosh, I hope not. You know, that's <laughs> you know, and that's and, and that's part of it too. I mean, I think that's part of the 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 uh, the, the, the premises that, that we all work with. You know, that that's not necessarily a good thing. You know, if we have manifestos or you know party platforms. Can, can I add? Um, Star, as you might anticipate, I can't abide. It. The binary that I mean, theory, practice, inside, outside, etc. Um, I think we need to historicize um, praxis and theoretical and intellectual work or labor. I think one thing that we learned over the course of the 90s, and frankly, on my point of view, the um, dumbing down of the American public and culture is that sometimes taking time to think is a radical act. Um, I don't think we want to, um, we are an intellectual project. Uh, I think we need to take that seriously. I also think we need to take our own practices more seriously. One of the components of this division, for example, was to think about pedagogy. 
right? Um, think seriously about pedagogical practice. Think one of the ways in which these sorts of things emerge, think about mentoring, think about, you know, this, this we had to struggle as a, as a young organization. Do we put young people in positions of institutional power and responsibility. Is that a responsible thing to do? Do we have people, right, spend their time reviewing hundreds of proposals before they're up for tenure? Is that a good idea? We, so think about our own pedagogy. My last forum was on pedagogy because I was reminded by Carol that, you know, we haven't talked about pedagogy in three years our own institutional practices. So I'm a little, I want to put a caution in there that being political and doing praxis means we're only out, or that's when we're out in the streets. And what we do here is, is not that. I don't. Um, and we should add, I mean, I think it comes back to the, to the other question. I mean, you know, we're all actually living in uh, incredible, in, in, higher, in higher education right now, the, in precarious times, right? The, these are extremely precarious times about uh, uh, our scholarship and what we're teaching in our classrooms and our disability to still be uh, professors, right? I mean, and the possibility of having new professors, right? I mean, the explosion of adjunct lines, the explosion of, right, that, that sort of the, 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 the going away of tenure, right, um, that we're all living under a, 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 in a process of a precarious um, uh, political economy of higher education labor, right, I think is the praxis, part of the praxis issue Right of our of our day, and I think it's part of what's what's associated with with uh, um, uh, making alliances all across in any division and any discipline and any specialization. Right, I mean we're all feeling this uh, new precarity. Can I just say one one thing in kind of response to the conversation, which is that um, I, I think what really important part of this division is that the majority of people who've chaired it have been untenured professors. And so we talk about that kind of fervor during the 1990s um, that led to it, but we, also, we don't talk necessarily about the fact that many of these people are not, do not have institutional security, um, at least you know, strong security, by the point that they sacrifice time, energy, parts of their lives to be part of this, this effort. You know? And I'm not, I'm not sure yet if we have enough tenured um, folks out there who could, you know, who could chair to... to to come up with a nice long list of, of uh, folks who would share the division in the future. So we're kind of perpetually young in a way. And so part of your question about responsiveness to the kind of social times I think has a lot to do with the, how young um, and how um, vulnerable folks are at the point that they get engaged, and, and which is part of why this has maintained a lot of energy. I'm not encouraging the division to continue forever um, uh, putting junior faculty in, in that position, but it, it does mark the division in a particular way. I don't know if other divisions have that, that kind of marking or not. Any questions? I, I should add, uh, you know, I'm an assistant professor. Um, <laughs> so I can speak to that. My vulnerability fluctuates daily, I think. Um, but one thing I should add, and if no one has a comment, um, and Ron, I know we won, right? But Ron was with me on um, Wednesday um, when we lost. Yeah. Um, and, and just what I'm referring to is the um, before the conference begins proper, if you're an office holder, you are part of the Legislative Assembly. And this is my debut this year. And um, five hours. Um, but in the midst of this, in terms of practice and speaking of this, whether we won or not, at the broadest sense of, is, our, is scholarship political? Is our scholarship political? Is that good or bad? Um, the Legislative Assembly voted down, by one vote, I should add, one vote, um, a resolution um, condemning torture and extended confinement. Um, extended solitary confinement. And to be fair, the people who voted against it weren't voting in favour of torture. Though, though, as has been discussed... If the resolution had passed, I think it would have needed 
automatically terminated the meeting, which was itself torture. So that, um, <laughs> so that had, and I suddenly realised now that should have been our argument, and then we might have actually passed it. Um, but in all seriousness, the people who voted against it, um, they spoke eloquently against it, and their point was that NCA is not a political organisation. Um, it was politely pointed out to them in sort of, <clears throat> I don't know, Com 101, that neutrality is a political position, but that didn't sway a lot of people in the room who were against the resolution. So there's that sense where, like, there's a space for us, right? And, um, but we're in an association where the majority of people at a legislative assembly believe that their work is not political or this association isn't political. Um, so I just throw that out there um, as a, you know, slight reality check and to kill time by people. Till people raise their hands. Thank you. So just briefly to add uh, the conversations that have been already going on as far as the question that the, the gentleman here asked and also the, the answer that Barbara and Ron and others uh, offered. It, in my understanding of cultural studies, I don't think that the division <coughs> and the studies has ever been about really um, solving problems, but as Barbara said, let us back off and think about um, how we how we think about these problems and how we analyze problems. I think that that has always been my understanding in terms of um, analysis of what is going on, and let's not really rush into this, um, you know, the rhetoric of urgency as um, Gina talks about that as well a lot. And so I think that my own understanding, and I'm relatively young in this um, in the division as well. But my understanding has always been that uh, we need to step back and really think about uh, what is going on because we cannot really affect change in the streets or whatever it is uh, without really understanding what is happening um, intellectually and, and in our minds and, and everything. Um, I think I had a, a second thought and it escaped me now, but I think it, all of this really ties well together. Oh, and I wanted to ask Ron as well because you were talking about um, how everything now is critical and critical communication and, and everybody almost in a sense claims critical scholarships. So where does that leave, what does it leave us in terms of, of this division if everything is then critical? What about the integrity of, of our scholarship and submissions and the journal and all that kind of stuff? So. Are there any criteria as far as, I mean, I'm sure, I know there are. But, but um, lots of people can talk about this. I, I yeah, mean, yeah, I, really. you know, I mean, I, no, I, I think that's an interesting question. I, I don't know what the, the dynamics of, uh, dynamics in which everyone thinks that everyone does critical cultural studies, right? I mean, I mean, we have a journal, but at the same time, it, 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 I don't know, I'm still trying to think through what, what, what that means. I think we all are. Like, I mean, because that's what I mean. I mean, you, I mean, you could call me a rhetorical theorist. I also write about film history. I write about debate history, right? I mean, I write histories of communication techniques and technologies, right? You just call me a communication historian, right? But I'm critical cultural studies. But I don't know what that means for anybody else except that... Uh, for a lot of us, we're visibly affiliated with this division. <laughs> you, you know what I mean, right? You know, um, and, and so I think that it, your affiliation with this division has something to do with how you get uh, positioned as critical in cultural studies in some ways, right? If you're a, if you're doing the leadership, right, <laughs> that kind of marks you in a way that somehow. Being, a, being in charge of rhetorical communication theory doesn't seem to, you know, to do that, right? And I, right, I think that's just strange, and I, I don't know what to make of it. But. There are many different ways to be critical in yeah. terms of the scholarship. Uh, I do want to come back to something that John mentioned as part of where are we going to go with our material and our submissions. In the normal transition of editorships, you uh, have two incoming editors in front of you here. I think I can speak for Kent Ono and Ron Jackson for Critical and Cultural Studies. 
and for myself replacing uh, or succeeding John Lucadius with quarterly journalist speech, that we both, that we all three buy into what John was saying about the function of an editor and the kind of work that we need to do as editors in developing young scholars and developing scholarship as opposed to simply rejecting scholarship. Uh, there's a very real difference where even in the process of a rejection, you get a sense of this isn't bad, it needs work, here are some things you can do to make it better, but right now I can't, I can't pursue it. And so making those kinds of very tough decisions, but leaving some dignity with respect to the person on the other end who's receiving that critical response. All of us have been rejected, I suspect, on this panel at one point or another, and all of us have seen reviews at one time or another that were rather disheartening, <laughs> to say the least. But uh, I do think that uh, the three of us, as we move forward, take what John was saying to heart with respect to the kind of journals we want to operate and the kind of work we want to receive and work with as colleagues. <laughs> yeah, I would, um, I'd like to speak a little bit to the kind of ubiquity of critical cultural studies because I think that the fact that everybody can claim to be under the sign of the critical is not to confuse us to think that there is not a particular political, intellectual, and possibly even ethical project of critical cultural studies. That doesn't mean everyone's unified. It doesn't mean that we're coming from the same um, theoretical intellectual positions. But it does mean that there are probably, whether we want to talk about those or not, um, what things that we would say share that kind of critical project. Um, and the fact that a critical terminology has been now dispersed across the discipline, if you will, I think we do not want to say that that is part of us winning. I mean, to me, that could be a part of an appropriation. It could be a part of a move that then kind of depoliticizes the project. And I think that's something we, we really do need to be aware of. At the same time, you know, none of us are, are comfortable in that kind of policing of the boundaries position. Uh, but there are reasons that, um, and some of which we didn't like when we were being policed out, but there are reasons certain kinds of, of policing, if you will, do take place. And, and that might be something that we need to take up and, and engage. Um, that what is the kind of political, ethical, intellectual project of cultural studies that has been invested in particular histories um, that care about transformations around cl class and race and sexuality and gender and nationalism and religion that we um, have kind of evacuated, if you will, if you look at kind of the, the, the kind of nomad quality of these critical practices. And I think that even going back to Starr's question about taking positions, and I think Barb's just right, that it is an intellectual project, and Megan Morris taught me this, that we need to have that time to reflect that intellectual tradition rather than being forced through the rhetoric of urgency to continue to do the same thing over and over again that simply doesn't work. And so the space to really rethink, but also to think about what has this space become and that kind of critical inflection is necessary. A little aside related to this that I think is interesting is everyone up here other than Craig has also been trained as a rhetorician. Um, and, you know, um, so there, there becomes a certain dominance. You know, we're all concerned with particular kind of critical reading practices. We have a certain lexicon that also comes out of um, ways of understanding textuality and discourse that when I've been a reviewer and, and been on the division, that's always an area that I think you know, comes up as a very interesting issue. I was on a panel earlier today in the rhetoric division with someone who does critical or calm, and it was, a really, it was, it was very interesting work and very different. And it was interesting that... Um, how, how do these other traditions that his project was very politically, intellectually invested, how do these other traditions then come and figure within the space of cultural studies, especially given our history, very invested within a particular formation within the field? So I think that's something to also think about when we think about these projects. In my policing role, um, we have about five minutes left if anyone has anything they would like to add. I, I just want to, for, for a second, just address Ron's statement, we won. I mean, I think, I think that kind of 
idea of victory is very interesting. Just just a few days ago, of course, we uh, 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 celebrated the fall of the Berlin Wall, another you know conflict that we won. Who is we and what is winning? I mean, I think that's we're always going to be kind of running back up against that. And I think you know that not to you know make this like the Cold War, but it was true of the Cold War. That's also true of this division. I think so. That's what I want to say. Now we've compared ourselves to the Cold War. I don't know whether there's anything more we can say. Up here. Um, if there, if there, if anyone doesn't have any. Questions. I do have an announcement, of course. As you're all here, I'm sure you're all aware that tomorrow is the Critical and Cultural Studies business, uh, Division Business Meeting, at which we will be electing officers and tenured faculty out there. We're looking at you. Um, <laughs> it's on at uh, 2 o'clock tomorrow in room 4M. And I just would also like to make a couple of other um, programming announcements. Um, this year we tried somewhat unsuccessfully to institute a series called Scholars and uh, conversation. Um, one of those panels, I just want to make clear, which was scheduled for this afternoon, is not going to happen. That was a conversation between Toby Miller and um, Lynn Spiegel. Uh, tomorrow, though, we do have two sessions that um, come out of the Scholars in, commu- in Conversation attempt. Um, the first is uh, at uh, 12.30 tomorrow, and again in room 4M, um, and it's a conversation between Bob McChesney and Dan Schiller, thus speaking to uh, an aspect of the critical and cultural studies division that really isn't represented here at all, which is political economy. Um, and then following the business meeting, this is all in the 4M. It's the place to be tomorrow afternoon. Um, so after that is our business meeting, and then after the business meeting um, is a session um, that Dilip Gunker has organised um, discussing the work of Lauren Berlant, um, it's slightly different from what is in the program in that there is now a panel of people discussing Lauren Berlant's work to which Lauren Berlant will respond. Um, but that is happening at um, 3.30 tomorrow. And the panel includes um, Dilip and Janice Radway and someone whose name is escaping me. So that is at um, 3.30 tomorrow um, in room 4M. So those are three things that are happening tomorrow with the Critical and Cultural Studies Division. Um, And at the business meeting, perhaps we can also address some of the issues that Chris raised um, about increasing our profile um, between um, conferences. So um, I'd like to thank all the participants for um, coming and talking today, and thank everyone for attending.